So today we're going to talk about romanticism. Hooray! Uh, and I will have the other two videos for this module up um, a little later, probably tomorrow. Okay. So, um, one of you wrote about uh, David's painting of Napoleon for our discussion. And that's a good kind of bridge painting between neoclassicism and romanticism because Napoleon kind of um, is the result of a lot of the things that happen while we're looking at um, neoclassicism. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, so if you see um, my notes on romanticism, there's more information about Napoleon and exactly what shakes out after the French Revolution. But basically, in 1794, Maximile Robespierre, if you know anything about French history, you probably have heard of Robespierre. Um, so he and his party, who are the, the people who were revolting, right, um, that David sided with, that he was kind of their propaganda artist. One of their other members was Marat, who we looked at um, David's painting The Death of Marat. So Robespierre and all those guys, they fall in 1794. Um, a lot of them are thrown in jail, a lot of them are executed. David barely makes it out alive. He goes to trial, he's sent to prison. Um, in 1795, he's released from prison. And so he kind of has to grapple with the new way things are in France and figure out what his place is in this new society. So he wants to rebuild his career. Um, so as I said, one of you um, for your discussion assignment will write about, or has written, excuse me, about uh, his portrait of Napoleon crossing the Alps, the famous Napoleon portrait where he's on his horse and the horse is rearing up. You've probably seen it. Um, so he makes work like that to ingratiate himself to Napoleon, who's now the leader, right? So that he can rebuild his career. Um, Napoleon is very pleased with this. He's very pleased with David's David's uh, switch in tone from, from supporting the revolutionaries to now being this kind of more courtly painter. And so Napoleon makes David the first painter of the empire. So Napoleon kind of viewed himself as the new embodiment of the classic uh, Roman emperors, essentially. And so he had these kind of grand titles and things for people in his court, essentially. So um, this slide we have in the top right the full view of this very grand, um, gigantic painting. Uh, it was, you know, 32 feet long that David did for Napoleon of Napoleon's coronation. You can see all the rich detail in, in these detailed close-up shots that I've pulled out. Um, okay, so that is what is kind of bridging us with David from neoclassicism into the like pre-romanticism, beginnings of romanticism. Um, another artist in this kind of bridge area between the neoclassical and romanticism is one of my favorite sculptors, uh, Antonio Canova. Okay, so um, Canova is a sculptor. Um, he's born in the 1750s. He's around until about 1825-ish, I think is when he dies, right in there. Um, and he works in this neoclassical style that is still fairly prominent. So he does work like this. This is Cupid and Psyche. So this is a, these are characters from antiquity, from um, classical mythology. And he makes this very beautiful um, sculpture that has that kind of pyramid composition like we see in paintings. Um, but it's translated here into, into sculpture with these strong dynamic lines. We have this, this kind of um, beautifully falling draping fabric. Um, so he does work like this that has strong ties to neoclassicism. And then he also does work like this. Um, and this is a very interesting sculpture because we have here this sort of bridge between the neoclassical ideas of um, mythology and, and the Enlightenment kind of aggrandization of antiquity and of classical thought, right? And the contemporary historical moment. So this is Pauline Bourgis. Pauline Bourgis is Napoleon's sister, okay? And she um, marries the leader of the Bourgis and becomes a ruler in, um, uh, over in Italy. 
And so she wants her, her portrait to be done in a way that likens her to Venus, okay? But not just Venus, Venus being victorious, Venus being the most beautiful. You can see she's holding the apple in her hand. This is from Venus's mythology, where she's in a competition with um, Hera and uh, Athena to see who is the most beautiful of the goddesses. And she ends up winning and wins the golden apple. So this is talking about her being victorious in that tale from mythology. It's also talking about the real contemporary um, figure, Pauline, uh, sister of Napoleon, and how she helps her brother be victorious in his conquest of Europe and helping him make alliances, right, by getting married. So it's this interesting kind of thing that takes a contemporary historical figure of the time and puts her in the um, kind of pose and role play of this mythological entity. So we can see these kind of alignments of um, ideas in Canova's sculpture. I also like to show this before we go into uh, Andre, who um, does this painting, which is one of the more more famous paintings from um, Romanticism, early Romanticism, or, or slightly pre-Romanticism, um, the Grand Adelesque. Um, okay, so David is very famous, of course, and he kind of bridges these different movements. Um, he's He also teaches painting, right? And his students become quite prominent artists as well. One of you will write about um, Anne-Louis Giraudet Triosson, who is one of his very famous students. And um, then this is his other, his, his most famous, most successful pupil, which, which is uh, Jean-Auguste Dominique Angre. Okay, so this is Angre's, probably his most famous painting, certainly one of his most famous paintings. This is kind of a departure from neoclassicism. So he was a student of David's, but he didn't totally agree with him stylistically. Um, so this kind of starts to lead us into some of the subject matter and some of the ideas of Romanticism. Um, this was painted for Napoleon's other sister, not Pauline, but his other sister, um, Caroline Marat. She is the Queen of Naples, so this is another, he kind of, um, as he was conquering Europe, he instilled, he kind of installed family members as surrogates for him in different um, important strategic positions. So we'll talk about his brother a little later, who he has to be the surrogate um, overseeing Spain when he overthrows the Spanish king later. Anyway, so this is um, painted for, it's commissioned by his Napoleon's sister, uh, Caroline. Okay, so um, basically, as I was saying, Angre, uh, he disagrees with uh, David on, on some ideas about style. So he is more interested in these ideas of a much more linear painting. So if you remember when we were talking about David last time, um, David envisioned himself as the pure Greek painter, that, that he took a lot of his cues from antiquity, from classical, um, particularly sculpture that he studied, and also from some of the masters of uh, the Renaissance. Um, well, his student, Andre, thinks that he is an even more purely inspired by Greek style, particularly the linear um, depiction of figures and forms on Greek vases. So, um, basically, he, he kind of goes a little further um, stylistically in that linear style than his teacher. Okay, so let's look at this. What does odalisk mean, right? Like, that's kind of an odd word. It's called the grand odalisk. All right. Um, so an odalisk is essentially a female slave or a female concubine in a harem, particularly related to um, Turkey. Okay, to uh, the women in harems in Turkey. Okay, um, so that seems like kind of a strange idea for a title of a painting. Instead of calling this like a Venus, which like the Venus of Urbino, you know, in these Renaissance and Baroque paintings, we had these nude reclining figures and they were always called um, something mythological to kind of make it okay, right? To make this gaze okay. Um, well, at this time, um, the reclining nude kind of takes this this other shift. So it's not a new idea. We've seen it in the Renaissance. We've seen this in antiquity. But this is this idea of kind of um, eroticism, but especially like exotic eroticism, okay? So this idea of the odalesque of a harem coming from Turkey, something from the East, something outside of what was considered kind of Western Europe at the time, 
Um, this becomes one of the hallmarks of romanticism as a movement. So this idea of the infatuation with the exotic, the East, this um, kind of fixation on uh, Orientalism becomes one of the things that uh, is, a, is a dominant theme and motif in Romanticism. So looking here, we can see that Angre, like David, admired Raphael. I mean, if you look at this figure, if you look at the shape of her head, if you look at the kind of style, you can see some, some reference to Raphael, certainly. Um, you also look at her kind of elongated limbs, the sort of looks like her bones aren't quite hooked up exactly right. We see yeah. some reference to mannerism. Right, so um, Hermogenino a little bit, a little bit of that kind of Botticelli, dislocated shoulders, long limbs kind of look. So despite these Western stylistic notes, the interest in Orientalism, Orientalism excuse me, is still um, kind of a, a looking forward into what's to become very popular in Romanticism. So we have this kind of exquisite corpse of a painting, this pairing together of different um, seemingly dichotomous ideas. So we have precise classical draftsmanship, thing one that Angre is known for. We have mannerist proportions of the body, and then we have romantic themes. So he's sort of a hodgepodge in the middle of these different movements. Um, because of this, this painting was not well received by critics of the time. They hated it. Uh, later, Angre is seen as an important bridge between neoclassicism and romanticism, but when this first debuts in 1814, the salons in Paris, it is not very well liked. Okay. All right. So if you look at my notes on Romanticism, you can follow the shift from um, the Enlightenment and this uh, reason-based thought to the romantic emphasis on feelings, desire for freedom, desire for action. So it's this kind of big push from like reason to emotion is the, the big through line between um, these time periods. So the imaginations of creators kind of can stretch more when they're reaching out uh, further from this idea of just reason and empiricism. Um, and sometimes with the with the stretching of imagination we go to some kind of dark places, certainly in Romanticism. Um, this ghoulish and grotesque kind of themes start to come up. Um, we pop in with our ideas of freedom and the exotic and the sublime in nature, there are also these kind of macabre, kind of darker things that, that come up, like the occult and like ideas of um, grotesque things, right? So a major written work of the time is by Edmund Burke. Um, he is British. He writes a philosophical inquiry to the origins of our ideas about the sublime and the beautiful in 1757. So that becomes another kind of area of interest for Romanticism is this idea of the sublime, this idea of the beautiful, and also um, an engagement with the antithesis of that. Okay, so what do I mean by sublime? When I say sublime, I mean feelings of awe mixed with terror. So things that are really spectacular in beautiful ways and also things that are kind of um, frightening. Um, so we see things like the glory and the destruction of nature, we see the fantastic, we see the occult, all of this starts coming into the art world at this time. Um, and this artist is a good uh, kind of introduction into when we get into the, like the true kind of themes of the Renaissance, of the uh, Romanticism. So this is a Swiss artist, his name is Johann Heinrich uh, Fenusli. So um, he switches his name, so he has an English pronunciation of his name, which is John Henry Usili. Um, he's lives from 1741 to, um, oh, I don't ever just write these down, 1820 something, 25, six-ish. Okay, uh, so he lives in Rome for a while. He lives in Rome for about eight years from 1770 to 1778 or nine. Um, and then he settles, um, he moves around Italy a little more and then he settles in England and he becomes an, an instructor at the Royal Academy of Art. So um, while he's there, and this interest in things that, that are emotional and things that aren't based on reason, he specializes in uh, night moods, is what he calls them. So night moods and the ideas of horror and of dark fantasy, which is a very kind of a departure from anything that we saw coming out of neoclassicism and the Enlightenment. 
Um, so this work is called The Nightmare. And here we have the sleeping woman. She's shown in white, symbol of innocence, right? She's totally unconscious. She's all stretched out. She's asleep. She looks fairly young. And then we have this creature sitting on her. So this is an incubus that is sitting on her torso. Um, an incubus is a demon, uh, a male demon that um, terrorizes women, particularly by seducing them, basically. Um, okay, so then what I think is kind of hilarious about this painting is we have this horse up here in the corner that you can see. Its eyes are kind of wild, sticking its head in through the, the corner. So the the painting is called Nightmare. The word for a female horse is a mare. The painting takes place at night, so I always think the nightmare is kind of a, the horse is like a visual pun. I don't know if that was intentional. Um, that's what always comes to mind when I see this. Uh, the actual word um, nightmare comes from, um, well, the idea of night, and then mare is Mara, M-A-R-A who um, was the Scandinavian spirit who tortured people while they were sleeping. So that's where Nightmare actually comes from. So I don't know, but he might've been mean funny by putting the horse in there. Anyway, uh, so Fusili is one of the first artists to try and portray the human subconscious and this idea of nightmare, this idea of dreams, this idea of things that happen and are real to us that we experience in our minds, but aren't out in the actual world of reason. So um, this, kind of delving into the human subconscious as subject matter is very important, not just in Romanticism, but in later movements. When we get into the 20th century and we talk about surrealism and the importance of psychoanalysis to ideas of conceptual art beyond surrealism. So um, Fusili is really ahead of his time as he, he starts this investigation into the subconscious and into nightmares. I always like to follow that one with this print. So uh, this is, uh, let's say it's whole name, Francisco Jose de Goya y de Chintas. So this is Francisco Goya, who's quite famous, um, Spanish artist. He um, has maybe the greatest range of any of the artists we're going to look at today during Romanticism. He does um, not just range in terms of techniques and media, but also subject matter. He's kind of all over the place. So we're going to talk about him quite a bit. I think um, one of you is writing about one of his other paintings. So Goya is super interesting. Um, he studied under the neoclassicist Mang, which one of you talked about him in the discussions from um, the last module. Um, after spending a year in Italy, he, he studies with Mang. Um, after he's in Italy, he comes to Spain and studies with Mang in Madrid. Um, but he kind of dismisses neoclassicism. He's not super interested in it. Um, here he portrays himself as being asleep while these threatening creatures seem like they're going to attack him. The title is The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. Um, owls, though we think of them as being a symbol of reason um, in some cultures, including Spanish culture, can represent folly. So they're kind of a silly kind of representation. We have bats here, which are uh, symbols of ignorance. And so they're all attacking him which, since we're on the cusp of the Enlightenment moving into Romanticism, it kind of makes sense. This idea of reason going to sleep and then monsters can arise is about the, the sort of um, shift in thinking um, from Enlightenment thinking to Romantic thinking at this time. Um, it seems like this piece would maybe be pro-Enlightenment, um, but it's kind of hard to tell because it could be an endorsement of the Romantic spirit and the idea of unleashing the imagination, even though dark things come with it, of that being a good thing, of that being a, a positive thing, especially when we look at the rest of Goya's work. Uh, in 1786, Goya becomes the official court artist of King Charles IV of Spain. Um, so let's see. Okay. So this is a uh, portrait, you can see what I mean by range. So here we have this um, etching in Aquitaine, this printmaking technique of Goya's. These are both also paintings by Goya. Um, you can see they're quite different, all three pieces stylistically and in terms of the way he uses the media. Uh, so, okay, so this is Charles IV and his family. Um, so Goya becomes the, uh, a, a court artist of the king, of King Charles IV. Uh, the people of Spain are very unhappy with him. They think he is a bad king. 
Ferdinand uh, VII, which is his son, it's Charles's son, who's also portrayed here. He's wearing the blue uh, coat kind of over on the left there. Um, he eventually decides to overthrow his father, to dethrone his father. And to do that, he asks Napoleon to help him. Well, Napoleon is very keen on taking over all of Europe and sees this is a good opportunity to get a foothold in Spain. So he says, sure, I'll send troops to help you overthrow your father. So he, they overthrow Charles IV, but instead of installing Ferdinand, um, Napoleon sends his brother down, uh, Joseph Bonaparte. And so Joseph becomes a surrogate who sits on the throne and is in charge of Spain, kind of as a surrogate for Napoleon. So it doesn't work out very well for Charles or for Ferdinand. Um, but so during this time, Goya is, is a court painter. He's witnessed all of this. One of you will be writing about the 3rd of May, 1808, which is the title of one of the paintings he did at this time, showing what happens during this takeover and during the aftermath. Um, it's one of his more important pieces. It's a, it's a political piece that kind of marks some of the shift between these courtly paintings and the darker paintings that he does pretty much for the rest of his career. Okay, so Goya during this time gets a mysterious illness. He loses his hearing, he temporarily goes blind, he temporarily becomes paralyzed. He eventually regains all of his feeling and um, ability to walk and move and, and his eyesight back, but he never regains his hearing. He's deaf uh, from here on out. And this makes him increasingly pessimistic and he's also in this country that's had all this war and upheaval. And so he just becomes, um, not a super happy guy. He gets he gets pretty uh, pessimistic and dark. The state of mind, uh, he goes out to live on this farmhouse and he does what are called his black paintings, which this is one of them. This is Saturn devouring one of his children. Um, so this is a mythological subject matter. Saturn, or Kronos as he's known to the Greeks, is um, one of the gods. He's one of the titans that rules before the Olympians, before Zeus and all those people. And he is told a prophecy that one of his children will overthrow him. So his solution to this is to eat all of his children, but he doesn't manage to eat them. He doesn't get Zeus. And then Zeus and Poseidon and Hades, who are brothers and are his children, overthrow him. Da, 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 da. Okay. So, um, because Kronos is kind of equated with time, right? It's a Greek word for time. A lot of art historians think that this piece is to do with Goya's despair at the passing of time. He's lost his hearing, he's getting older. Um, I also think that it would make sense that the subject matter resonated with him because he's the court painter for King Charles, who is then overthrown by his son Ferdinand, right? So the idea of a king of the gods eating his children to keep them from overthrowing him seems like it would be a reasonable subject matter for Goya to explore. So in this, we can see his range from this very like detailed, um, kind of soft focus looking family portrait to this very rough kind of um, expressive brushstroke, very, very dark kind of painting uh, that we have of Saturn. Okay, so the next artist, this is one of the paintings that I equate, when I think of romanticism, this is the painting I think of. And it's also one of the paintings that is just, there's, I, I almost, I'm loath to show you a slide of, of the next paintings I'm going to show you because the experience is so different than when you see them in person. So all of you go to Paris, go to the Louvre and go walk up to this thing and stand under it. You have to stand looking like straight up at it. And it's a completely different experience with all these gigantic romantic paintings. It's a very different kind of experience to see them in person than to see them with a slide. But we'll do our best. Okay, so this is The Raft of the Medusa. This is by Theodore uh, Gericault. He lives from 1791 to 1824. He's very, very influential and very famous. Um, he's one of the artists most associated with Romanticism. He only had a 12-year career. He dies quite young. He's like 32 when he dies, which I think is also how old Watteau was when he died. So that's a bad age if you're an artist. <laughs> if you're a French artist and you're 32, try to, you know, be careful. Um, okay, so he um, is interested in, in studying from masters and apprenticing and things, but he thinks that he maybe will skip the whole study neoclassicism kind of idea 
and instead um, the Louvre, which was formerly one of the royal palaces, has now begun its time um, as a museum, which it's a museum contemporarily, but uh, basically Napoleon goes all over Europe conquering things and he brings back many spoils of his military campaigns. He brings back all these wonderful paintings. He has Titians and Rubens and Van Eycks and Caravaggios and Rembrandts and he needs somewhere to put them. So he puts them all in the Louvre, which was formerly the Royal Palace and people are able to, with permission, go and study there. So um, Gerard Colt decides that that is where he will get his education. He will go and stand directly in front of these amazing paintings and learn indirectly from the masters of the past. So he's kind of um, self-educated in that way. Uh, he loved Rubens. He was particularly interested in Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens, and he saw something very different there than he saw from David's work. So David is still kind of the superstar um, who everyone is studying, and, and if you aren't studying directly with him, you're looking at his work and studying with his students. This was true of Jericho as well. But he um, he's much more interested in the idea um, of something that isn't quite so clean and tidy, right? When we look at David, we see these really perfectly smooth compositions that um, don't have the thick kind of expressive brush stroke that you see for example, in Peter Paul Rubens' paintings. So, Gerard Cole is much more interested in, in that kind of work. Um, he, he then decides to go to Italy and, and study with Italian painters because he thinks that style might be more in keeping with what he's interested in. He then comes back. This uh, is his most ambitious work. Um, it's 23 feet wide. It's quite large. Um, it's called The Raft of the Medusa. So, it is exhibited in the Paris Salon of um, 1819, it immortalizes this shipwreck that happens. There's a ship called the Medusa, and it wrecks um, on July 2nd, 1816. As the ship is going down, the officers and the captain of the ship take all the lifeboats up. They all go in the lifeboats and take off safely. So they leave the passengers, there's 147 passengers, and they leave all of them and, and some of the crew to die. So um, the carpenter, ships at this time had a carpenter on board to repair things, kind of fashions together this raft out of pieces of the ship as it's going down. Now, the raft was much larger than it's portrayed here um, in this painting because originally the 147 people were on it. So it drifts for 13 days and the starving passengers dwindle, a lot of them were injured, a lot of them fell off, they got dehydrated, they were starving, there was a lot of cannibalism that was happening because they didn't know how long they were going to drift and everybody was kind of panicked. So it's very, very gruesome and eventually there are only 15 people left on the raft. So in making this portrayal, um, the artist scales down the raft to fit how many um, ultimate survivors there are at the end, right? Um, the Argus, which is another ship, spots them and rescues the living, the remaining um, passengers on the raft of the Medusa. This had a huge political impact at the time. It was unlike anything that anyone had seen. Um, you know, we have uh, this horror and chaos and these strong emotions, both of the tragedy and the devastation when you look at the, the anguish in the people's faces, but also this emblem of hope. So. Uh, Jarek Holt decides to portray them right as they're starting to they see the Argos coming for them. They see it off in the distance and they're waving and trying to get its attention. So we see the, the, the death and the despair in the kind of lower portion, the foreground of the work. And as we move back into the pain, we kind of move up towards the light and also kind of at the, the hope, the light at the end of the tunnel. So it's very emotional. Um, he also was interested in the grandeur and the impact of neoclassical historical paintings, so he wanted to create a really dynamic uh, kind of composition, um, and he wanted to get, uh, he wanted to imbue real emotion and real, real pain into, into the faces of the people that he was portraying. So to do his studies for this, he went to hospitals and painted, he did sketches and drew people who were dying. He also went to morgues and drew lots of people who, were, who had died. Um, he makes an interesting composition, rather than the triangle or the inverted triangle or pyramid that we see a lot, he has an X composition, 
right? So when you go from the sail down to this body that's kind of falling off the raft here in the bottom, you have a strong line. And then from this, um, the feet of this person who's nude here in the corner up through the arm extended with the, the material waving of uh, the person at the head of the ship. Um, you have this kind of very dynamic, like a literal X in the composition, which is new. So that's, that's not something that we've seen before. Um, the closest one we looked at Ruben's uh, deposition from, or, or excuse me, the raising of the cross, we saw a strong diagonal that kind of had a uh, almost an X in the composition. We see these kind of writhing piled bodies. So even though these people are starving and they probably wouldn't have had this sort of heroic musculature going on, he's looking at artists that work in that way and he's interested in showing the drama and the tension in the bodies, right? You know, the bodies kind of piled on top of each other so we get that desperate kind of feeling um, the name of the man who is kind of the hero up at the top holding the uh, piece of fabric is uh, Jean Charles he is the only black survivor of the of the shipwreck um, and he's hoisted up on the shoulders of his comrades here to uh, flag down the Argus to kind of be the symbol of hope um, the composition makes it feel like the corpses in the lower half of the painting toward us are literally falling off and down into the viewer's space, right? Because it's such a strong diagonal and it tilts out toward us, it feels like they're going to fall off, especially when you're standing in front of this. It's up quite high, at least when I saw it last at the Louvre, and you're looking down and it feels like these bodies are going to come off of it onto you. Um, so this caused a huge, a huge sensation, right? This idea of this chaos and torture and this crazy composition that made you feel like the painting, the bodies were coming out of the painting. Um, it also has a, a, a political bent, right? Like, so it's a commentary on a real event that happened and how terribly the officers and captain treated the other people on the ship as it was going down. And it's also a commentary on slavery. Um, so... Jericholt was a member of an abolitionist group. He thought slavery was absolutely abhorrent. He was extremely active um, in trying to get rid of slavery in all the colonies around the world. He was he thought it was uh, terrible. Um, and basically, that's why he situates Jean Charles, who's the only person, who, person whose definite name we know in this portrayal, and he puts him, he was a, a black soldier, and he puts him as this like emblem of hope going forward very intentionally in the composition because he's an abolitionist and he wants to draw attention to this issue. So the idea of the plight of tragedy in this specific incident is supposed to also mirror the plight and tragedy of slave ships and of slavery in general around the world. So it caused a sensation in a lot of different ways. It was, it was well regarded and it was a very memorable, very impactful piece. Okay, <clears throat> the other artist that in my mind is kind of the guy of Romanticism is Eugene Delacroix. Um, so we looked at Angre uh, a minute ago, the Audelesque, the naked woman with her back to us. He and Delacroix are portrayed by critics at the time and by um, people who do caricatures and things in printed material as being in this competition. We see this in art history a lot. Like later when we look at Matisse and uh, Picasso, we see them in dialogue and in competition with each other. So Delacroix and Angre are definitely portrayed that way. Angre is this kind of neoclassical holdover. He's very interested in this uh, classical draftsmanship and the linear quality of work and thinks of that as being the most important. We have Delacroix, who's known as this um, superb colorist. His color is considered really incredible is expressive use of brush strokes and this is an old thing right back in the renaissance we had the same kind of thing the design versus color so this is something that goes on in art history and is kind of attention forever um it's an old rivalry okay so this is delacroix um this is the death of sardanopolis um it is inspired by a specific narrative poem so in uh, 1821, Lord Byron, who is an important writer of this time, um, writes a poem that's about uh, Sardanopolis. Um, Delacroix depicts this last hour of the Assyrian king's life. 
so that's who he was. Sardanapalus was this Assyrian king. Um, his actual name was Asher, um, let's see, Asher Haneral, but the Greeks called him Sardanapalus, so in the mythology that the poem is based on, that's what we know him as. Uh, okay, so basically he is in his tent and his encampment and he is told that his army has been defeated and that his enemies are coming in and they're gonna kill him. So um, in the poem it's this sort of very um, solemn sort of sacrificial suicide of honor but in the painting Delacroix goes kind of a different um, a different way with it and we have this sort of um, orgiastic destruction that's happening, okay? So he knows he's gonna die, so he wants to be satellite on his pier, on his pyre, pardon me, but he also wants all of his possessions to be destroyed. He doesn't want his enemies to have all, any of his treasures, right? Well, his treasures include all his gold and little, literal jewels and treasures that he wants broken up, but he also wants them to kill his horses, want him to kill his women, his harem, they want his, he wants his slaves killed, so he considers all of these living um, human people to also be his possessions and he wants them all killed with him. So that is what's happening in this painting. So we have the story of someone from the East, right? This idea of the exotic, this idea of um, kind of the lure of the mythos of the East and this uh, Orientalism, this interest in, in Eastern narrative. And we have this kind of erotic subject matter We have these naked concubines from the harem and they're stretched in these very um, kind of crazy positions right we have this horse in here that looks terrified and it's being pulled in it's very high drama very difficult poses to portray so it's this idea of kind of peak emotion and drama okay and Delacroix chooses to portray it this way to kind of show off to show off his abilities um, to create this scene of, of chaos, right? But to create it in a really um, lurid, rich kind of way. So it's this super rich, super saturated color. Um, we have our this king reclining on his funeral pyre and watching his guards enact his order of destroying everything. Um, we have torturous, difficult to depict poses, super rich color. So it's this kind of erotic, violent thing that's basically this Western sort of fantasy, right? This kind of Western fantasy um, for the, the Western viewers of this, this romanticized um, East. Okay, let's look at a different Delacroix. So this is his most famous painting. If you've seen one, this is the one you have probably seen. Um, it's Liberty Leading the People. And um, it's based on the events of July uh, 27th and 28th of 1830. So this is the... Um, this is a, another uprising, okay? So we talked about the French Revolution, this is later. This is the Parisian uprising against uh, Charles X. So basically, um, we have these kind of events from history that are very dramatic, like this one that you, that are kind of in the Far East and are far removed. And then he's also depicting things that are contemporary and very much a current event of his time that he considers important. Um, so he wants to create a record of contemporary events, and he also wants to create these kind of romantic allegories, okay? So here we have Liberty, she is bare-breasted, she is holding the tricolored banner, which is the symbol of the Republic, and she's urging the masses forth into battle. And we have these kind of stand-ins for different kinds of Parisians at the time. So we have this young kind of street boy with his pistols, that's standing next to her. On the other side, we have this um, university student who's dressed in that kind of garb. He has his top hat. And then next to him, we have this guy in um, overalls who's kind of a rough laborer, and he's um, he's joining the fight as well. So we have he has his cutlass sword. We've got the university student with the musket. We've got the street guy, the street kid with his pistols. So basically, it's liberty taking people from all walks of the Parisian life, the oppressed, in, in the different tiers, and urging them forward to fight, right? Um, you can see in the background the towers of Notre Dame when you look through the haziness of battle, so that does ground it in Paris. So even though this could be just an allegory of liberty in general, we have the tricolor banner, 
and we have Notre Dame telling us exactly where we are and what's happening. Okay, so let's hop over to England and talk about landscape painting or something that seems completely different, but it is definitely related. Um, okay, so the three big ideas of Romanticism, we have the emotion, particularly emotion associated with oppression and freedom. We have an interest in the exotic. And then the third thing is the sublime, um, particularly the sublime in nature, right? So this is uh, J.M.W. Turner, Turner of the very long name, so we kind of shortened it a little bit for him. Um, he is around from 1775 to 1850 ish, 51 maybe. Um, and his interest, he's English, his interest is in the, the kind of quest to elevate landscape art and, and make it um, have the same kind of prestige as portraiture, portraiture and historical painting do at the Royal Academy where he teaches. Um, so he's very known for landscape work. He's also probably best known for his seascapes and his paintings that are to do with seascapes and ships like this one. Um, he had a very wide range though. He did all kinds of landscape um, and seascapes and things like this. Uh, what I love about him though is his, the way he uses color, um, which is why I picked this particular painting to talk about. Um, he exhibits the passion and the emotion and the energy of romanticism through pretty much exclusively color, like subject matter as well, but you have to really sit with it and to kind of figure out what, what his paintings are exactly about beyond just the emotional impact you get with the color that he uses. Um, he uses color in a very turbulent way often uh, in this painting, for example. He, like Jericholt's uh, Raft of the Medusa, is not shy at all about um, depicting disaster, and particularly depicting disaster based in real events um, to illustrate a political and moral position, which is what's happening here. Um, so, to give a little context, in 1781, there's an incident which is reported in um, Thomas Clarkson's book, and his book is called The History of Abolition of the Slave Trade. Um, and it's reprinted in England in 1839. And it was widely read, and Turner is one of the people who really made a study of this book. Um, so basically, in this painting, we have the slave ship Zong, and it was uh, en route from Africa to Liverpool. The captain of the slave ship Zong realized uh, he has all these slaves who are ill. He has all these slaves on board who are sick. And he realizes that if they are lost at sea, insurance will pay for them, will reimburse him for the loss, but if they just die of disease en route or if they die um, once they get to Liverpool, he will not be reimbursed. You can see where this is going. He's a very evil person. Uh, so basically, he orders these 50 sick people, sick and dying slaves, to be thrown overboard so they will drown. He leaves their iron manacles on them so that there is no way that they can swim or anything. It's totally barbaric and horrible. Um, and Turner reads about this and is horrified. He's also an abolitionist at the time and felt quite strongly um, against the slave trade. He thought it should be ended. And so he creates this painting that is kind of, um, it's not exactly subtle, but the subject matter is sort of subtle, right? When you first see it, it just looks like this it looks very abstract, it's very colorful, it has these kind of dynamic sort of brush strokes. And then as you look closer, you see maybe the the ship back there, you can kind of see the lines of the mast, and you're like, oh, this is a seascape, like at sunset maybe. And then when you start really looking in the foreground, you start seeing people's limbs, and you start seeing these shackles and chains, and then you start seeing these um, groups of fish and sharks that are devouring these humans that have been thrown overboard and you kind of realize that this is not just a beautiful seascape, this is a horror and a horror that actually happened. So he has this kind of mastery of drawing people into the work with the color um, and then it's, it kind of like punches you in the face, right? You really see what's happening. So his energetic brush strokes, the haziness of his forms, and this kind of indistinctness of his composition 
intensify the color. The color is thing one and we're drawn in and then we have to kind of decipher the rest of the action and what's happening. Um, the forces of nature and the painter's own emotional response to the subject are really vibrantly expressed as one kind of thing in these, these um, very expressive brush strokes and this intense color. So the reality of the color is one with the reality of the feeling and it all kind of pulls us in together. Um, this is very new, right? This is quite abstract. When we look at, when we think about work on the spectrum from uh, represent, totally representational work to abstract work, this has, uh, leans a little toward abstraction until you really get into it. So this is, is quite sensational at the time. This has not been seen before. Um, so for a lot of reasons, this painting is quite important. Okay, for a totally different kind of landscape, let's, um, Across the pond and go over to America uh, and talk about the Hudson River School. Okay, so the idea of, it's hard to shift from that topic to this one. They're, they're so um, disparate in terms of subject matter and that last painting makes me kind of emotional. So it's a, it's a little bit of a hard shift for me. Uh, okay, so we're in America, Hudson River School. Um, the American ideas about um, that fall under romanticism kind of lean heavily into the ideas of nature and the splendid, the, the splendor of nature and, um, the spectacle of nature. Okay. So, um, this is Thomas Cole. He is kind of seen as the leader of the, the Hudson River School. It's not a literal school. It's it's what we classify this group of painters as, and he's he's kind of the the front runner guy. Um, and basically, his main ambition is there's some kind of snobbery about the American landscape from painters on the continent in Europe and in England, who think that there's nothing much interesting to portray over here because we have. We, we don't have um, this w long Western history that they do in Europe. Of course, there's the history of the Native Americans, but no one is portraying that. Um, so his goal, Thomas Cole's goal, is to show that America is beautiful and splendid and worth portraying and has grander landscapes even than anything in Europe. And that's kind of one of his main ambitions is he wants to go and show the uniquely splendid specific locations in America. So he has these really specific titles like this one. So this is the oxbow, that's the river, like the, the shape of the river. And it's specifically the view of this oxbow from um, this particular mount and in this particular town and it's right after a thunderstorm, right? So he has this very, very specific, the oxbow view from Mount Holyoke, Northampton, Massachusetts after a thunderstorm is the whole long title so that we know exactly the moment that we're looking at. The idea of capturing a moment is something that we'll see um, addressed in a very different way when we talk about Impressionism soon. So keep that thought in mind. Okay, and you can see here, he's very interested in a naturalistic, a more naturalistic, more realistic portrayal of what's happening, right? So we don't have this dramatic sort of abstraction that we do with Turner, looking back at his work. We have um, a return to representation and to an emphasis on realism over uh, the kind of drama, right? Because he wants to realistically portray these wonders of the American landscape. Okay, this is the last guy we'll talk about today. This is another Hudson River artist, another American, um, Albert uh, Bierstadt, Bierstadt, excuse me. And um, he's another person who is very interested in the landscape. Unlike the very literal direct landscape and very specific landscape paintings of Thomas Cole, Bierstadt is more interested in using landscape as allegory. Particularly, he's interested in landscape as allegory for moral and spiritual issues of the time um, and some political issues. In this particular painting, which is among the Sierra Nevada mountains in California, um, basically he, he did this in a whole series of paintings he did of the West. So he travels West, he paints the Rocky Mountains and lots of views from there. He paints Yosemite and the valley around Yosemite. He paints the um, Sierra Nevadas as he has here. And he's focused on the breathtaking scenes of the American West because he wanted to reinforce the idea of manifest destiny. So, um, if you remember from American history, 
uh, in Manifest Destiny is the 19th century doctrine that um, advocates for the expansion of America all the way to the West Coast, basically saying that the, the destiny of the United States is to expand all the way to the West Coast, uh, that that's the logical end, basically, for America. Um, so this piece is kind of propaganda, right? Um, this is a, a, a kind of a body of painting that's used to quash concerns, like people were very were kind of worried about the displacement of Native Americans. They're worried about um, the exploitation of the environment, concerns that are still issues today. Um, but the Hudson River painters were kind of like really focused on this idea of the grand American West and how to portray all this natural splendor and bring it back so people can see all this beauty and abundance that exists. So they're using color, they're using representation, they're using light in a way to really highlight this kind of natural splendor of the American West. Okay, so that is Romanticism. That's a lot. Um, we will talk about the shift into realism, which is why I end here with landscape, because it kind of funnels us towards the next big uh, movement, which we'll talk about realism next time, and then we will talk about early photography. All right.